Good evening, everyone. It is Wednesday, July 21st. Welcome to the Congregation Lador Vador Rabbi Sam Silver Controversial Issues Forum, which is held monthly on the third Wednesday of each month. Um, we're delighted to have Rabbi Barry Silver with us tonight, and as our guest, Jeffrey Van Trees II. We're going to be talking about education and politics. What is wrong with education in our world today? and possibly go to resolving some of what's wrong with some solutions um, and how we could fix it. So with that, I'll let Rabbi Barry take over and uh, take it away, gentlemen. Thank you so much. Uh, and this is being recorded. So we do have a minion for this discussion, which is uh, 10 people but this could be viewed by hundreds or thousands because it'll be preserved forever. And I have a feeling that our guest, Jeffrey Van Treese, one day will probably be in political office and someone's gonna look back and say, hey, look at that. <laughs> There's when uh, Jeffrey was uh, just getting his name around and starting out. And uh, so you never know who might be watching this. This is a really great discussion that I'm excited to have with Jeffrey because he is an attorney and a teacher, and he's also very involved with the community, with the Democratic Party, and with various organizations that are trying to make this world better. So I'm letting you know ahead of time that Jeffrey is aligned with the Democratic Party, and uh, I served in the legislature as a Democrat, and then the Democratic Party actually succeeded in taking me out. So I uh, have kind of a mixed relationship with the Democratic Party. Um, but I still belong to the Democratic Party. Uh, there's a lot of interesting topics that we need to discuss. And the topic is education and politics. And just like our founding fathers wanted to try to keep religion out of the government with separation of church and state, they also obviously would want to keep it out of education because education is part of the government. And children come there as a requirement. And so you don't wanna have children coming to a public school and then being subjected to things that are unconstitutional by their promotion of religion. So religion and education and politics seem to all go together. And there's been a lot of things happening recently involving education and politics. And I'd love to get uh, Jeffrey's take on this. And before you do, Jeffrey, tell everybody a little bit about who you are, just very briefly your background, and then share with us what you think of the topic, if there's any issues that you think have come up involving education and politics. Jeffrey, it's all yours. Thanks so much, Rabbi. Uh, and I think this is a, a critically important topic. Uh, and I think that it's actually, in many ways, sort of the root of, you know, failures in education are the root of a lot of the problems that we have now. And it's a huge part of the solution. Uh, obviously. A little bit about myself. I've been, in, uh, I've been an attorney for, gosh, 11 years now, practicing in the area of uh, commercial litigation. Uh, I also uh, am a scientist. I have a master's and PhD in soil and water science, and I am a professor uh, actually at Palm Beach State College, as well as uh, Palm Beach Lakes High School, but I teach at Palm Beach State College, both in the Department of Environmental Science, as well as uh, in pre-law studies, and I've published in both uh, law and and science. So uh, everything from boundary issues between neighbors to infrared spectrophotometry. So I have a pretty broad, uh, broad interest, academic interest. Uh, so obviously I'm partial. I think education uh, is, is really important. And I think that uh, so, so many, so many things that are, are kind of backward with education, but if you think about it politically, uh, there, and it is mixed in, and Rabbi is absolutely correct, it is, it is interwoven. You have politics, you have religion, you have uh, an, an education. And the thing about education is it has such a profound effect on our society, that is whether we have an educated population or not. There, the economic implications are enormous, uh, as well as uh, the survival of our species being uh, dependent upon having an educated uh, population, uh, especially when we're facing huge potentially catastrophic issues like climate change, uh, for instance. Uh, and so, but from a political standpoint, 
it very little, there's almost no payoff for politicians to advance education because it's a long-term investment. In other words, if you think about it, the, if you look at, let's say, whether children are learning long division in elementary school, the consequence of whether they learn that or don't learn that is profound, right? Because it's going to determine whether they are able to succeed in college, whether we're able to have engineers, doctors, uh, lawyers, accountants, you know, the, the skilled professions that we need. And so whether they receive, uh, whether children are able to learn to read and write the English language or other languages and whether they're able to learn math and science is, has a profound effect on society. However, it's long-term. And so it's always going to be beyond the scope of whenever the next election cycle is. And so there's very little payoff to say, okay, uh, you know, I was governor or I was uh, legislate late later or whatever, and I passed this law, passed this bill, I passed these measures that uh, resulted in kids learning more. There's almost no payoff in that because it's going to be years or even decades down the road. And so one of the things that we've learned that's very backward about a lot of our system, particularly our version of capitalism, which is there's many versions of capitalism, but certainly our version, what we would call state capitalism, or uh, by which you have everything is driven by short-term profits. That's sort of the auction that we have with politicians. And so it's, everything is always going to be very short-term. And so the short-term economic significance of at least the education system at the K through 12 level is daycare, right? It's, and we saw that. It's, it's not just not, it's not my opinion or speculation. We saw that in no uncertain terms with this pandemic. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Rabbi Silver uh, had the opportunity and, and I was sort of working with him a, a little bit, but he did, mo he did almost all the work with regard to representing several teachers that were forced to go back into the classroom, right? It, it, was, it was just absolute madness. We remember what the, number, the COVID numbers were last summer, right? But the concern was we need to get we need to get the kids back in school, not because, and I don't think anyone would even suggest with a straight face that it had anything to do with concern about learning. It was about getting daycare up and running so that people could go to work. And so that is ultimately the function of schools. And, and in fact, virtually every, every uh, school district said to the teachers, if you're not willing to come back, we will replace you with a substitute teacher who may know absolutely nothing about the subject because getting a warm body in the classroom to provide daycare is more important than having a certified teacher that actually knows the subject. So it's not like my speculation that it was just laid bare with the policies that were implemented by all of the school districts throughout the state. And so we have what I call a, a daycare center priority. That's the, that's the number one priority of schools. Education is, is uh, secondary to that. And you, and you see that in terms of all, all the way down the line when you look at, uh, at the policies of school boards throughout the state, throughout the country. Everything is about making sure that students are you know, physically there to be, you know, that, that, that the daycare is provided, but not wh wh whether students are actually learning is very, very secondary. Um, as far as what is taught to them, that's also driven by economic interests. And so when you see you know, think, you know we're, we're seeing it right now, something like critical race theory, which has gotten a lot of attention, right? Uh, it's a completely non-substantive issue, right? This whole thing about critical race theory, all, all it really is, I'm, I guess I'm one of the few people, because I went to a small liberal arts college, I actually knew what it was beforehand. Most people don't know what critical race theory is. All it really is, is the historical study of racial disparities over time. Really shouldn't be that controversial, uh, but that's something that has gotten an enormous amount of attention uh, really because it's a distraction off of other things that we should be much more focused on. But everything from you know, not questioning, things like income inequality, wealth or wealth inequality, uh, whether you know, the, the role of the United States, for example, and in various international conflicts, they all kind of follow this, uh, this, this, uh, this narrative or pattern that uh, is not necessarily accurate and doesn't necessarily reflect uh, the reality that we know happened in history or, or uh, that has, uh, reflects what many scholars you know, would say almost unanimously about various things, whether you're talking about Jeff, civil let, war. Let, me, war, um, so let me jump in on two of the issues that you were talking about um, sure. that, that I've had experience with also. One is 
when you mentioned that the schools are really warehouses or babysitting mm -hmm. for kids, mm -hmm. there is a serious problem, and I've spoken to you about it also, yeah. of children who misbehave and cause trouble and disrupt the classroom. It's almost impossible to get them out of the classroom, especially in certain schools in certain areas. Mm -hmm. And so what you have is an impossible situation where there's disrespect and disruption and you can't teach. And the reason is because there's really no place for these kids to go. They have to be in school, they can't be with their parents and they have no other place. So the teacher has no ability to toss them aside and to let the class go on and function. So that's why I represented a teacher who was assaulted by a student. And mm -hmm. the student had a record of 15 prior incidents. Some of them assault, yelling and swearing at teachers, all types of stuff. Mm -hmm. And the kid was still in the, in the school. And after this incident, this student beat up this teacher and the teacher had some rather serious physical injuries. And at the end, before she got off the teacher, she was publishing her, she said, if you say one more word to me, I'm gonna rock your world. And then she was pulled off. And when I questioned the principal and said, why is it that this student was allowed to stay with 15 prior incidents? He said, we don't believe in punishment. Mm -hmm. We believe in natural, con natural consequences. So natural consequences is like, the teacher, there's no discipline. It's just, there's some natural result that happens. Like if you eat a lot of candy, 15 years later, you'll get fat, but nobody's enforcing anything. So natural consequence, yeah. the natural consequences is a complete utter disaster. And, yeah. uh, but that, that was one thing that, that was going on there in the schools that I saw firsthand. And so uh, the, what the teachers are going through is, completely unacceptable and they're and they're treated with a great deal of disrespect by the students and their supervisors the the other thing you were mentioning what was the second issue that you were talking about i wanted to have something to say about also. the sort of the the great how how american history is sort of oh the right the critical race theory i, I do want to mention something about that this is my take on it mm -hmm. and and i like to approach everything rationally okay so you got this critical race theory. And like Jeff says, it's a very broad thing. It's really just teaching about the, the, how, races, how racism, races have been treated throughout history. However, within that rubric, you could go from one extreme to another. For instance, many people who are teaching this, especially uh, blacks who are teaching critical race theory or devising it, their narrative goes something like this. Blacks have been mistreated and subjugated to vicious racism since day one. Slavery, Reconstruction, Jim Crow, KKK, and the whole country is just rooted in racism and it's still here right now and it's still going on. And the whites are pretty much responsible for it either by actually inflicting it or looking the other way and benefiting from it. And so they should feel really guilty about it. That's like one extreme. The other extreme is racist, slavery happened a long time ago and it's over now, all right? Get over it. There's, there's, there's no reason for us to do anything to try to fix a situation because there, there is no more racism. Yeah, there's a few people here and there, but racism is a thing of the past. Both of those extremes, I believe, are inaccurate and dangerous. And, and I think the, the, the truth about racism is somewhere in between and reasonable minds need to come together and talk about it, but they don't. If you watch MSNBC, you'll see the first type of people, racism all over, it's permeating, we gotta do more. And, it, and then if you watch Fox News, it's like racism, what are you talking about? There's, there's no more racism in the United States. If anything, it's the opposite. The whites are discriminated against. I think people should be able to talk about it rationally. And I don't think that's happening. Jeff, I'd like your take on that as far as what, what do you agree with my position that someone in the middle or are you on one end or the other? What do you think about this? No, no, I, I, I agree with that. And I would, I would add to the discussion that some of the defensiveness that is sort of comes up with a lot of white people when they hear that, uh, a lot of it can actually be avoided, both the, both, uh, because 
the what we think of as privilege, right? White privilege. So if you th the, it would it might it seem everything is sort of expressed in this zero sum gain dialogue, which is actually a fallacy, right? So in other words, if a person of color were to gain some rights or gain some privilege, that that would therefore have to be taken away from someone else. And, and there's no reason to think that, right? So in other words, if you're a white person, let's say, one of the privileges is, is that you are less likely to be arrested without cause, right? Doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that you're immune from it, but statistically, if you're white, you're less likely to be, let's say, pulled over by police for no reason. If, that, the, if the amount of wrongful detainments and arrests against people of color were to go down, it's not as though it would have to increase for white people, right, in order to make up the difference. Well, that's true, but with college admissions, it's mm -hmm. a very different story. It is a zero-sum yeah. game. And also with certain job opportunities, it, it's a zero-sum game. That's, that's what the problem is. When, when you're taking in a certain amount of people or excluding having like a limit on how many Jews you can take in, which was done, Mm -hmm. there is, that is zero sum and it happens also in employment. So I agree with you in a lot of areas it's not, yeah. but in some areas it is. And we need to have a discussion about that because it's not fair for people who are working hard and doing the right thing to be discriminated against in reverse. We do want to increase opportunities, but we don't want to have reverse discrimination. I would like to hear from the others now, um, from, from what, weigh in on any of the issues that we've talked about so far, the discipline, the critical race theory, and then we'll go on and talk about other stuff. Anybody have anything they'd like to share? Um, yeah, Valerie. Well, uh, thank you very much, you know, Jeffrey, for joining us. This is very topical and, and, and in some ways very disturbing. Uh, for many years, I was an early childhood educator. I worked mm -hmm. with children you know, from four years old through six years old. I was a Decker early childhood development assessor. So I was able to really work with a lot of the children. Um, part of the problem, as you had mentioned, is children learn how to be educated from a very early age. If you think of Howard Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences, children's brains are compartmentalized, whether they learn kinesthetically or musically or rhythmically or academically. Uh, and what I found is when you have a group of, of 20, 20 to 25 children, which was the limit, and that's young children. And budget wise, there was no assistant in that classroom. And you have one or two, four, five, six year old children that have either learning disabilities or behavioral problems. What do you do with 20 kids when you have five children that are disruptive and you don't have assistance? That's part of the problem. Yeah. So I agree with you that a lot of it is budgetary and you have to address those issues. With regard to critical race theory and teaching, there's nothing wrong with learning about that specific topic, providing it's taught in the context of American history. There's no question that these, these atrocities happened. Slavery has happened all through the history of, the human, of humankind, regardless of where it happened, how it happened, who it happened to, slavery has always been part of the human history. But as far as the United States go, there's nothing wrong with teaching critical race theory as long as it's not a part of the chapter being taught as the entire book, okay? They're taking a chapter of American history and making that the entire book. And that is, for me, is where the problem is. It's not being taught in context. And whenever you take something out of context, it is inevitably blown out of proportion by the radicals on one side or the other. So that's, that's my take on the situation. It's not being taught in context of American history. We don't teach civics anymore. We don't teach a lot of subjects that are very, very critical to overall understanding of American history, as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Are you saying that in your opinion that the issue of race is like permeating everything and so that they're not really learning in a, an objective way? Because obviously, if you go into a classroom, they're not just going to be learning about race. They're going to be learning about all types of civics and different historical periods. So they're not just going to learn the whites are bad and we were enslaved. But I think what you're saying is that this issue is permeating a lot of other topics. And really, I think that's what their goal is. I think the goal of some of the people on the far left is to teach like everything in a, in a context of racism, like to see how racism plays a part in like 
everything in history and current events and economics and psychology. It's like everything is turned on race. Is that, is that what you're talking about? Yes, everything is focused on that one specific topic. I and mean, there's the religious differences, there's political differences, um, there's cultural differences, there's racial differences, you know, and as society has evolved, so the issues and the understanding of these various issues have evolved. So, you know, you have to teach what is going on now in the context of what has gone on and how the country has progressed. And when you focus on one specific topic and make that one small topic the focal point of the entire history of this country, I think that is, that is out of proportion. And I think part of what is being taught now, especially with young children, you know, they're, they're not being taught the overall uh, the history of this country and what happened and how it happened and how it evolved and where we're going now and how we can resolve these issues. You know, so there's, there's, yeah. a, there's a yeah. lot to be discussed in, with regard to, to critical race theory. It's not yeah. that it should be totally yeah. ignored, but that's a small chapter of an entire book. And you can't yeah. make a small yeah. chapter of an entire book, the book. Yeah, Valerie yeah. raised a good point. And Jeff, I'd, I'd like to get your take on this because you, like you're in the school system. Mm -hmm. Obviously the kids aren't being taught slavery to the exclusion of other things. They're, mm -hmm. they're being taught all types of stuff. But if I understand Valerie correctly, and I tend to agree that there are some people who want the issue of race to almost overshadow or to be used as a lens to see everything. And therefore, like if you're talking about the American Revolution, if you're talking about George Washington, if you're talking about Thomas Jefferson, you can teach things in different ways. You could spend 99% of your time talking about Jefferson and the constitution and the enlightenment, or you could spend 80% of the time talking about how he owned slaves and he was part of the, I mean, it's a matter of focus. Mm -hmm. and, and I think what Valerie is talking about is like making this issue overshadow other things, which loses perspective. But on the other hand, there are people who are saying like, okay, we taught about slavery. We, we had a, you know, one day we spent time saying, yeah, there was slavery and the civil war ended it. But if you do that, you're not really getting into the, the horrors and the, and the influence of slavery and, and what a deep stain it was on the country and the after effects. I think the, the difficulty is figuring out how much of a focus should we put on this issue and how much influence is it having today that the vestiges of slavery. And that is not something that an individual teacher is necessarily equipped to answer. And it's not something that even the experts are gonna agree on. So this is a very difficult question and again, it's something that needs to be discussed rationally and logically, and it's not. It's being discussed politically. Uh, Jeff, go ahead. Ten, what do you think about this issue? I, I, I think so, and I think that it is uh, one of these issues that can divide people very, very easily. And I think that it's also a way to kind of lump everybody together, right? To say that if you're uh, somebody that is concerned about, uh, about, let's say, racial inequality, right? Black Lives Matter, then you're part of this sort of extreme radical group that maybe a very small people necessarily belong to if you're saying absolutely everything under the sun has to be uh, view, viewed through the lens of race. The other thing is, is that there are a lot of uh, racial uh, disparities uh, that are sometimes caused by some of the institutions that we're talking about today. So when we're talking about, let's say school discipline, you know, or I, would, I taught at a, at a, or at a um, very, very difficult inner city school, right? And one of the things I can I can say uh, from speaking to many others, people that if, if, a, if a principal is interviewing teachers for a job, right? If you are at, the, at a Boca school, let's say, or a Jupiter school or Wellington school or, or an affluent suburban area, and they have their choice between having either somebody that's a, a really great subject matter, really great at the subject matter, they know their stuff, they have really great results as a teacher, but they might say there's some questions about whether they, they're disciplined as a disciplinarian. Contrast that with an inner city school, which is gonna be predominantly minorities, they have the choice between picking somebody that's a disciplinarian or somebody that's better at teaching, they're gonna go with the disciplinarian every time versus in a more affluent community they're going to go with the better teacher because the discipline is not as important in the more affluent areas because they just don't have as many issues. 
And so when you deal like at a, at a certain schools, let's say that have gang members and, you know, there's large numbers of, you know, you might deal with certain schools that have large numbers of what we call uh, students that are, that are classified as EBD, which I'm sure Valerie is very familiar with that, emotional and behaviorally disturb, uh, emotional and behavioral uh, disorder students that create huge problems. They have to be restrained and this and that. And, and other schools don't have to deal with that as, as often. They don't have the same percentages. You look Jeffrey, at the number if, of if you were a principal, if you were a principal at one of those schools, you would do the same thing, wouldn't you? You have if no you choice a, because the yeah. system requires it because the, the system essentially makes them do that because the ability to expel a disruptive student is all but impossible. I can say, you know, speaking to attorneys, I got to meet, I got to meet all of the school board attorneys. Barry knows them well. So for example, I sure when I was do. speaking to, to Julianne, who I'm sure you knew Julianne, right, Barry? Uh, you know, when I was talking to Julianne at one point, uh, what, you know, what, what, what their policy is or what they tell, tell teachers and principals is you can't get rid of a student. You can't expel a student for being, quote, you know, a pain in the, a pain in the rear end or whatever. And to, you know, to, to me, that just kind of struck me as a little bit trite uh, because disrupting, because if you're in a classroom and you're making it impossible for 30 other students to learn, that's more than just being a pain in the neck, right? That, that, at that point, you're, you're really trampling on the rights of others because the other students have a right to an education and, if one, and, and no one student should have the right to make it impossible for others to learn. And in fact, you know, I think back to the old adage, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. The idea that the rights of one person stop where another begins, right? That's generally how our laws are shaped, how our society is governed, right? You, you know, we, have, we, have the, we don't have a right to run through a red light and so forth. But that's what goes on in schools. It's just, it's, it's a place where since we're warehousing people, you can't expel them for really anything short of burning the, the school down. We have yeah. two alternative schools in basically, you know, three alternative schools in a huge county like ours. And those students that make it impossible, that, that terrorize the school, terrorize other students, and I've seen plenty of them, they can go to an alternative school, they can, get, they can get educated there, and they're not going to be able to endanger other students. I mean, I, I, I witnessed one of my students, a sexual battery happened right in front of me. Uh, and and nothing, basically nothing happened to the student because he had an IEP. And he was uh, labeled emotionally behavioral disorder. So he can, it, it's open season, he can go uh, grab other students in their private parts. And that's fine. Yeah. These, these labels, these labels are really a terrible thing. When, when a kid yeah. gets a label and that's a license to do any of this. I'm, I'm interested in getting Irene's perspective. She's been sitting, uh, listening, muted, but she's got a lot of experience in, uh, and a lot of smarts and wisdom. I'd be curious, um, Irene, I don't know if you wanted to just be a passive observer or uh, get involved, but I, I would be interested in hearing your opinion on all of this, if you don't mind weighing in. You're muted right now, but if you could unmute, I'd, I'd love to hear what you think about this. Well, I think it's a, a problem that's current and I understand um, how it would be difficult to teach that subject in a public school when um, it's so complex. It's so complex that I think a young child couldn't really understand why some people hate others and some people do not and some people accept them. It's a very complicated issue. I can see in upper grades where you could have an intelligent discussion, but little kids, I don't see how they, how you could really uh, give them the, all the information you need in order to understand the problem. So I think it is, probably very difficult to deal with little children on this uh, very sensitive issue. Yeah. Well, you know, there are ways that you could teach a little kid. You could, you know, like have a classroom and say, you know, if there was one kid who looked a little different or acted differently, you don't want to pick on that kid. There's ways of doing it. But I, I think the real difficulty is there are some people who believe that racism is a persistent problem today and one that we need to do something about and that the white people are responsible for making it happen 
and by doing nothing, perpetuating it. And there's like white guilt. And there's other people who think that's preposterous and there's no consensus on it. So, and people feel passionately on both sides. And the problem is, I think we need to have a discussion as a society about this issue so we know, or collectively we can agree on how we're gonna approach this. And we might not all agree with it, but the problem is the discussion is not taking place. And instead it's politicized. There's, there's no rhyme or reason to it. it. It's similar to the Holocaust education. You know, you have to teach Holocaust, but what do you teach about it? Do you teach kids that there's a reservoir of anti-Semitism from Christianity? Do you teach that? Many people think you can't teach the Holocaust without it. And other people think, oh, I'm horrible. You're gonna teach people negative things about another religion? You can't do that. And others are saying, no, you can't even understand it without doing that. that the problem is we need to have a discussion and consensus on some of these issues. Um, I, I, now I wanna talk, uh, Jeff, I, I wanna talk to you also. Oh, go ahead, Sharon. Well, I think a big, a big issue in education today is bullying. I don't know whether it's, it's an issue with racism, but bullying both in the classroom and on social media, I mean, it, it, is, it is escalated substantially over the course of the number of years. Um, and, and I don't know how, how can they not have discipline for this when they see, like what you said, Jeff, uh, watching a kid with an IEP uh, just about attack other people. He's basically got full reign to do whatever he wants. And it could be a person with an IEP. It could be somebody who doesn't have an IEP, just thinks he's better than everybody else. And he can bully everybody, whether it's in the classroom, outside of the classroom, or on social media. And these kids, it, it's just awful what's happening. And it's yeah. really having a harmful effect on our on our on our youth. And, and it also makes it impossible for them to learn, right? It, it's very yeah. it, you know you yeah, can't learn in an, in an environment where you're being terrorized or where the teacher is being terrorized. Uh, that's why we have a lot of teacher turnover uh, as well. Excuse me. Um, but if you uh, but yeah, I think you're absolutely right. There's um, there's an issue there, and there there have been attempts to make laws or policies regarding bullying, but. The question is, does it actually stop the bullying? And I think that what we're seeing is generally not. And the, the you know what what happened, and then you, you also have this sort of gray area between what the school has authority over, right? So does the school have authority over what happens online? Well, they really can't control what happens in their own classroom. So the idea that they could con control what's going on on Instagram or Twitter is is uh, is virtually impossible, but I think that's a major that's a major issue, uh, and you know certainly I've seen, you know, kids today are just so, um, you know, they're they're just so addicted to their phones that they practically live on those things, and so it's I think that's that's contributed a lot to this the sort of the anonymity of the bullying that somebody can just post something without actually seeing someone face to face or without having that face to face discussion. I yeah. think that that's made things a lot worse as well. So as, as, as a lot of the good things that come with technology, that's I think one of the, one of the negatives is the uh, sort of the anonymity associated with, with online bullying. Yeah, I wanna, um, I, I'm glad you brought that issue up, Sharon, because I think that is an extremely serious issue. And the county, if you talk to the school board in the county, they agree with you. They have anti-bullying programs. They say we have zero, I've seen zero tolerance. They mm -hmm. say it, but mm -hmm. in my opinion, it's window dressing. It's not doing the trick. There's all, and it's not just bullying. I've dealt with people, especially teenage girls who are fat shamed. Like they, they put something out there on the internet, she's fat. And then all of a sudden it's like, everybody's saying horrible things about it. Can you imagine how, harmful this is for someone to be subjected to this. I've seen people that don't wanna to go to the classroom. They don't wanna walk into school because of all this shaming. I, I represented a kid who is, the, who is the victim of bullying and the school did absolutely nothing. You know what that school was? It was Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. And then at, at like two years after that, then I saw about this, this kid who went on a shooting spree and what, if you'll pardon the expression, what triggered it 
I mean, the kid was a lunatic and he had access to guns, but he was seriously bullied to the point that the kids at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas after the shooting, quite a few of them said, oh yeah, we knew something bad was gonna happen. We knew it, this, this kid was being tormented and bullied and he, he had no friends and he was saying crazy things. They say that the motto should be see something, say something. We need, and this, is, this has to do with what Irene was talking about. We need to teach kids, if you see someone who's sitting by themselves, say something, say hello. If you see people on the internet who are saying things about another kid, challenge them and support the kid. We need to have assemblies where people are told, we're all in this together. We're all one human family. We, we have no tolerance. That is not being done. And, and I feel bad for the kids in school today because with the cyberspace, the bullying is a lot worse. My, my kids, fortunately, you know, like, like they're, they're kind of like, well, one of them's with the cool kids, you know, so he, he doesn't really worry about that. But even if you're, everybody is subject to this stuff. And if you're a victim of it or a perpetrator of it, or a silent observer of it, it's bad news. And it's destroying not only children's lives, but our society. So I agree with you on that. Now, I wanna, I wanna bring up another issue. And Jeff, I'm interested to get your take on this. Yeah. In God we trust. And they put this in all, in all the schools. There's a, there's a law now. It's gotta be in every school. And now, in addition, Governor DeSantis says, and we have to teach that the United States is an exceptional country, American exceptionalism. Why? Because of our Judeo-Christian tradition. And every child must say a pledge of allegiance to the flag under God. Jeff, tell me what you think about all this. I, I think that this is one of those issues that it's it's a it's totally non-substantive in nature, right? It's not, uh, you know, we think of all of the godless things that come out of our uh, come out of the people that I'm sure are uh, insisting upon this or, or writing this. But it's number one, it's 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 baiting those of us that are trying to uh, advocate for the separation of church and state. And the, and the thing about American exceptionalism is. It, it's it's what it's what it's doing is it's trying to divide it's, it's trying to divide us right it's, so it's saying well American is American exceptionalism is exceptional for whom right so would we say that would that include uh, you know Black Lives Matter is that part of uh, American exceptionalism or uh, you know or democratic socialist is that part of American exceptionalism it's, it, that, that's that's certainly not what they're what they're uh, what they're going for there. Um, but I think that the, the, you know, in God we trust, insisting that that be spoken by students is, I think, probably a blatant disregard for the First Amendment. It's also a way to, to rile up the voters and the voting base to say, while we're poisoning your water, poisoning your air, while we're allowing uh, Wall Street and banks to rob you blind, while we're committing all kinds of exploitation, uh, go focus over here on this issue. That's kind of where I see where I see a lot of this. Yeah, I, I happen to think that we should be teaching kids in education we trust, in mm -hmm. knowledge we trust, in science we trust, in, in love and friendship, community we trust. But in supernatural beings, I don't think we should place our trust. And it is, you're right, it's a clear violation of separation of church and state. They think, well, we're just talking about God. Everybody believes in God, right? It's just generic. Well, no. Not everybody believes in God and you shouldn't have to and you shouldn't, I think we need to be more sensitive when it comes to kids because they're there against their will and also that's when they can be indoctrinated when you're teaching them from an early age. And I, I don't think we should be in the business of indoctrinating students. And, and you think about how far that is from the purpose of <laughs> what the governor is supposed to be doing. I mean, the, you know, the, the governor is not you know, supposed to be really concerned with with uh, whether somebody says under God or not in the classroom, that's that's sort of way beyond what the governor is supposed. To, governor is supposed to be doing things like built, like helping us with building roads and hurricane shelters. <laughs> that sort, you know, help, helping us, uh, 
you know, uh, deal with the, the coronavirus pandemic and everything else that they failed so miserably at. So it's interesting that he's uh, concerned with uh, the morality, teaching the morality uh, of whatever to our children, the morality of the Judeo-Christian tradition, which the fact that he even says, that, I think is a prima facie or on its face uh, shows an unconstitutional intent at the very least. There is a lawsuit brewing and uh, <laughs> I've been yeah. approached by some to take it on and I'm it would be a lot of fun. Anybody else want to um, share some thoughts on that? Rachel is from my hometown of Stamford, Connecticut. So I assume she must think the same way I do. We're from the same city. I'm just yes, kidding, yes. but go ahead, Rachel. What do you think? Oh, I, I sent you uh, uh, something on Facebook. It had the date that um, it was actually all started in the 1920s um, under God. There, there are four. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so it wasn't until the 1920s that that all got put in. Right. It's all... I don't know why it hasn't been fought. Yeah, you're, no, you're right. It's, it's obviously not from the founding fathers. They were the no. exact opposite. They didn't want this at all. You're right. Right. Well, well, I believe this will be, Rachel. So <laughs> we'll keep you, you posted. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already, I'm already being approached. I'm already talking to people about a legal challenge. Yeah. Um, the Mishka, I'm, did you want to weigh in? Yes. Oh, go ahead, Rachel. Let, let me hear from I, Rachel and then Mishka. Okay. I was just going to say, I'm new and I'm shocked what I'm hearing about the public school system here. Yeah, it's got a lot of problems. Go ahead, yeah. uh, Mishka. Well, <clears throat> when we brought up the thing about under God, I'm a university professor. I teach online courses and uh, worldwide. Half of my students are from European countries. Occasionally I get some from other areas. When the question of God comes up, there's a, often the question, which God? <laughs> <laughs> so just, I just thought I'd bring that up. That's a very good point. Thank you very much, Mishka. <laughs> well, I, I think that the, the, the people that would advocate for such a bill would try to sort of make any opposition into a travesty as though there's, uh, you know, we, we hear the word woke thrown around a lot and, you know, opposing this might be considered woke or, you know, cancel culture, any, any of these other, you know, social terms that are being thrown around by people like Ted Cruz and Governor DeSantis. And, and you really think, you know, are they really elected to, to uh, you know, to police our you know, our particular article of faith or morality. And you, you really see why the separation of church and state is so important. Because yeah, God, forbid, think, yeah. God forbid, pardon the fun, God forbid that it be up to politicians to determine whether we trust in God. Yeah, right. if God, if God needs these politicians to help him out, he, something's wrong here. Go, <laughs> go ahead, Sharon. <laughs> um, you said something a little bit ago when you were talking about critical race theory. So, there's always been like um, percentages that employers have to employ, like a percentage of Hispanic, a percentage of black, a percentage of Asian. I don't know exactly, but I knew there was always something of, of uh, black and white, you know, how, you know, how many people they had, if it's a big company. So does that come down to critical race theory, even with employers, would you think? Well, well what I can go say, oh, go, go ahead, Rabbi. No, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, uh, one, one of the things that might surprise people is that in Florida, it, it, race cannot be taken into consideration for any type of governmental uh, job or university admission or anything if it's a state entity since 1998. Um, that just might come as a surprise. And so what, one of the things that we found is the, uh, is that it's kind of overstated the significance of this. If a private company wants to do that, it's free to do that, but there's no legal mandate that requires that they hire any percentage one way or the other. And in fact, if they did that, they might be opening themselves up to a, uh, to a civil rights violation or a potential civil rights violation if they're, uh, having, if they're excluding people on the basis of race. Yeah, yeah I've, I've never been a fan of quotas it's very often come back to have serious harm against Jewish people. Mm -hmm. And I'm a, I'm a big fan of trying to provide equal opportunity and to give people the opportunity to help themselves. But the, 
the quotas, I don't think is a good thing. Uh, Rachel, you have something to say? Yeah, I worked in the EEO department of Olin Corporation. And if you were a federal contractor or had over 50,000 employees, you had to do an affirmative action plan. And I actually had to do affirmative action plans. And there is a statistical um, formula that you have to go through where you find out how many people, what race, what religion, so on and so forth. And you do have to meet the quotas or else you may not get the monies. What, what races or nationalities were included in the quota? Like it, was, it would have been black, but they would say like Hispanic, East Asian, Latina, um, what, what, what were the categories? Back then, it would have been Black and Latino um, and maybe Asian. But there's, and it's just not, it's so complicated because it's your geographical area that you're looking at. So if there are 2.5% people who are Asian in that community, your workforce has to reflect 2.5%. Correct me if I'm wrong. I thought that was struck down by the Supreme Court in the early 2000s. Well, it probably was after her time, after the time that Rachel's talking about. No, they're Rachel. still doing. They're still doing affirmative action plans. With quotas or with uh, point systems? Call it quotas. They, they're, they still, they're still quotas. using quotas for governmental. Governmental funds are tied to racial quotas. Not racial. I mean, that's this is where it gets really. It's hard to articulate. Matter of fact, I forced Stanford, Connecticut to do its affirmative action plan because it wasn't doing it. Okay. Um, okay. But it wants you to match what your geographical area is. Yeah. Well, there's all different types of ways that companies get around whatever the rules are. So who knows? Interesting. Uh, anybody want to share anything else about uh, education and politics? Uh, I'm interested in hearing some maybe concluding remarks. Um, go ahead, uh, Valerie. Yes, I, I'd like to get Jeffrey's take on this because I've noticed, you know, not that I'm in education anymore, but of course we have children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. And I find that over the past 15 years, maybe a little longer, that schools have suddenly become surrogate parents. Suddenly schools are responsible to give children their breakfast, give children their lunch, give children their dinners, give children after school programs, give children weekend programs, giving them everything that a parent should really be responsible for. And I find that that has put a tremendous, tremendous burden on teachers. When you take an educational course and you learn to become a teacher, that doesn't necessarily make you a parent of 25 or 30 people constantly. And right. I think budgetary right. and politically speaking, that you know, there is a real issue and people might not think it is an issue, but I happen to think that it is an issue. Schools are not surrogate parents. Where are the parents when you come to bullying, when you come to behavioral issues, when you come to you know, the requirements of raising a child? That is not the school's responsibility or should not be. So I, I'm, I'm curious as to have, how Jeff really feels about something like that. Oh, I agree completely. And I think that a lot of this, if you think about it really at its core, what schools are is they, what schools do is they subsidize employers that don't pay their employees a living wage. So if you think about it, part of the cost of living, right, food, shelter, and daycare, right? So uh, since people barely have enough for food and shelter, the, they, the government has to step in and provide the daycare, which is what uh, the schools are. So that's, I think, where the surrogate uh, parent uh, aspect comes into play. Uh, and so, yeah, no, I, I completely agree with that. And it, it, it's become, uh, it, it's, it's expanded way beyond the role of education, right? And so, you know, you look at the goal of edu, you know, it's called the Department of Education, not the Department of whatever else. And so, yeah, I think that, I think you're absolutely right. I think that sort of this expanded role that the schools are, are supposed to play and teachers are so, supposed to play that comes at a cost and that cost is education. Uh, that's education, you know, taking education seriously and trying to make sure that our students are as knowledgeable as they need to be to enter the workforce. I think that that definitely takes a back seat. Just one other thing I just wanted to mention, you know, you're talking about something like climate change communication, something I'm very involved in. Uh, really that should be at like a middle school level subject 
uh, you know, the concept of the greenhouse effect, but that's something that most adults and certainly most students that graduate high school could not explain, uh, as well as many other, you know, very sort of simple, basic things. And so you kind of wonder if the school's taking on this, this sort of role of, of parent, whether, whether we're, you know, falling behind, let's say other countries where that's not so much the case, like, you know, Asian countries, many European countries that have much higher educational outcome, better educational outcomes uh, than we do, where they have other social programs that take care of those things other than the school, right? So you, you wonder if a, if a school is supposed to also be social workers and, uh, and uh, you know, provide uh, for nutrition and everything else, you know, beyond what's going on during the school day. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of parents that are not equipped to raise their kids and so they rely on the schools and so we need to try to help teachers because they have to do so many different things. Mm -hmm. um, I want to wrap this up and then I'm going to introduce something new. My father used to write an article in the Yiddish press called Bintel Briefs. It's, um, it's uh, like letters to, it's like kind of like Dear Abby. These people would write letters with their problems and then the editors would um, respond to it. I, I live another life that you don't know about. It's a, it's a secret life in cyberspace. Every time I write an article in the Jewish journal, I get quite a bit of serious hate mail, mostly from right wing and from the Orthodox. And I respond to everybody. And I thought it might be interesting to share a little bit of my secret life and some of these exchanges um, without, of course, mentioning anybody's name. So um, when, when we're done with this discussion, I just want to read you a, a brief exchange I had, which I thought was kind of interesting. And I, I might do this on other occasions too, because there, there's some fascinating discussions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask if there's anyone else who wants to weigh in on this topic. And then I'll ask uh, Jeffrey to, uh, finish us out. And I do thank you for uh, joining with us and for your expertise and also for uh, being in the trenches yeah. in the school system and trying to um, make a difference. Anybody else want to share anything on the topic? All right, Jeffrey, go ahead, close us out, and then I'll read a little bit. Sure. Well, I just, again, want to thank, uh, thank everyone and Rabbi Silver for uh, having me here tonight. I think that uh, I think that having the, these types of dialogues uh, is absolutely critical. And, uh, you know, I, I love speaking to enlightened uh, people like this kind like the, like those of you in this congregation and exchanging uh, some really great ideas. So thanks so much for having me. Thank you very much. So um, I was in this exchange with someone after one of the letters I wrote and the person said, they've actually been to Lador Vador and said, you know, you, you need to, talk about the Torah, because if you don't believe in the Torah, then you're going to lead everybody astray. These, these people are going to have nothing to do with Judaism because you don't mention the Torah. So I mentioned, I read out of the Torah every Shabbat. I do a Torah study every Tuesday. I'm constantly referring to the Torah. I just interpret it differently than you do, <laughs> but I consider the Torah of central importance. I think it's a tree of life that grows and adapts, not part of a petrified forest. So then he, uh, he says that, he responds like this. I know what you are doing most of the time. You did give a wonderful Devar Torah when I was at your shul one evening. So I cut you some slack about Joseph and his brothers. And um, then he says, uh, I use the art scroll stone edition Chumash and the Midrash says, and the Midrash says series of books as well as many others. This is what is known as Tr Torah true Judaism. Most Jews have a third grade Jewish education. I would like them to have at least a high school or college level Jewish education. If you don't accept the Torah as being true, as well as the 16, 613 mitzvot, then you are leading them astray. That's all there is to it. I am sure you are aware of the extremely high assimilation rate. I would like your help in lowering it, okay? So then I respond, teaching children that God wrote the Torah is not just leading them astray, it is brainwashing, child abuse, and irrational. And one of the main reasons that many young Jews want nothing to do with Judaism. And so that was um, 
the exchange that we had. I, I had another exchange with someone that I'm not going to read to you because we went back and forth a couple of times. And um, he's, he was challenging my view about God. And he's saying, you're wrong because you're from the left. I said, no, I'm on the left on some and right on the other. But what is it about my view that you disagree with? And he just said, well, you're on the left and you don't have balance. I said, I'm going to ask you again. Give me something that I said or some fact that I said that you disagree with. And then he just comes out and says, you're a, and it was like all these expletives. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't, I can't read it for you. But apparently when you ask some people like, do you have any evidence or facts to back it up? They get really mad. <laughs> Go ahead, Sharon. <laughs> did, did the gentleman or woman respond <laughs> after your last uh, <laughs> response? Now, I sent that out shortly before the, um, this, this Zoom broadcast. Oh. I haven't got a response yet. But I've had quite a few of these types of conversations that are pretty interesting. One of them, one of them with, a, with an Israeli Orthodox with like 10 kids. And he wrote an, he read an article from the Jewish Journal and he was so like incensed, but also just so concerned about me. He called me from Israel. And I remember the call because I was watching my son, he was playing in a tennis match. He called from Israel and I thought, yeah, I can watch the match, but I got to take this call. So I talked to him. We disagree so very fundamentally but he's kind of like me in that he'll talk to anybody. And we chatted and we chatted. And sometimes it got a little bit abrasive, but we chatted. And then he's the one who said to me when I turned 63 in like January of that year, I turned 63 in November. He said, what are you doing for the 50th anniversary of your bar mitzvah? And I said, you know, I didn't even realize that. It takes somebody from Israel to tell me that, hey, your 50th anniversary is coming up. Thank you. So we, we have a very good friendship and we disagree very strongly. His kid is now getting bar mitzvah. And, um, I, I, and I think he's gonna like include me in a Zoom link or something like that. So it can turn out very well, but there's a lot of fascinating discussions that I have. So I'm gonna share a little bit with you on, on other occasions, because I think it's kind of interesting, but I, I, I'm curious to get his response. Anyway, it was a great discussion today. I think what we're attempting to do here is to have rational discourse, hearing both sides, and there's a, there's a minion here, but I think that what we're doing here is important, and it'll have a, obviously more impact if we have not 10, but 100 or 1,000 or whatever. So I'm incur I thank you for being here. We will be marketing at Lador Vador. We will be investing in Lador Vador because I think there's a lot of people who would be interested in this and we will spread the word. And I hope that you also will spread the word about what we're doing. And I sincerely thank you for being part of this conversation and for helping to spread rational discourse because that's what we need today. We need to speak to each other in a friendly way. Thanks everybody. And thank you, Jeffrey. Thank all thank of you, you for being here. Take care. Thank you all. Hello. Bye-bye.